uh, and to take this opportunity to thank them for their continued support and it is something that is very much appreciated. So I'm pleased to be welcoming an in-house audience today as well as an online audience. It gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Stuart McLachlan, and co-founder and CEO of Anthesis Group, and my colleague, Jonathan Pinsk, Professor of Strategy, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship, and Executive Director of the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research here at AMBS. Our facilitator this evening is Sarah George, who is Senior Reporter at Sustainability Trade Title, Eddie is joining us virtually. Um, so this is an unusual arrangement. It's the first time as, as we experiment with many new ways of doing things. So Stuart is co-founder and CEO of Anthesis Group, a global sustainability specialist with which started trading in 2013 and has grown to over 700 people spanning across several continents. The group has a client portfolio that includes many Financial Times Stock Exchange 100 and Fortune 500 companies. And it was set up to make sustainability happen. And the group is a certified B Corp supporting clients to make the transition to a decarbonized and more sustainable future with a focus on analytics, solution design and implementation for brands, corporations, cities, and government. So prior to Anthesis, Stuart spent 16 years developing the WSP environmental and energy business, building it from a startup in WSP Group PLC to one of the leading global consultancies in the sector. For six years from 2006 to the merger with Geneva, Stuart was served, also served as a PLC director on the board of WSP Group, again, uh, FTSE 250 company. In addition to his business and his focus on business leadership, he has a passion for sustainable development and is a speaker on market trends and the relationship between sustainable futures and business success. In 2019, Stuart featured as the LDC One to Watch, and in 2021 was listed in the top 32 ESG pioneers by Business Leader magazine. Mm -hmm. Today, Stuart will argue how sustainable performance drives value through economic, environmental, and social dimensions and see superior financial performance as the other side of meaningful purpose. Strategic connections between system shifts, drivers of change and geographic materiality with a deep understanding of how, how clients create value will become the ingredients of sustainable performance. So after setting out his vision of sustainability, Stuart will have a discussion with Professor Jonathan Pinsk about what it means for business to become a leader in sustainable performance. So as we've heard, Jonathan is, Jonathan is a professor of strategy, innovation and entrepreneurship here and executive director of MIOIR. His interests focus on corporate sustainability, business model in innovation, social entrepreneurship, cross-sector partnerships, and the sharing economy. Jonathan analyzes how firms make strategic decisions to adapt to a more sustainable economy and deal with the ensuring tensions between issues and actors. He also investigates barriers to firm adoption of disruptive technologies from cognitive, organizational, and institutional perspectives. Now, before moving to Manchester and AMBS, he held positions at the University of Amsterdam and also at the Grenoble School of Management. Jonathan has authored more than 50 scholarly and practitioner articles in a whole variety of journals, and he's an associate editor of Organisation and Environment and Business Society, and also past chair of the One Division of the Academy of Management. Now, facilitating the discussion this evening is Sarah George, who is senior reporter at Sustainable 
Sustainability Trade Title Eddy. Sarah is an award-winning journalist with a passion for telling stories that matter. She joined the editorial board of in May 2018 and has been at the front line of sustainable business news, attending key industry events, conducting high profile interviews and writing in-depth analysis pieces for the website. So there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of today's session for your question answer and questions and answers. Of course, we will take questions from both of our in-house audience, so you here today, but also our online audience as well. Those in the room should raise their hands and we will come to you in turn with a microphone. And for those of you online, you can participate via the comments section and we'll get the opportunity to pose questions there. So we do have a lot to cover. I'm very excited to hear the presentations. And without further ado, I will hand over to Stuart to begin his presentation. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion, discussion about a subject that uh, we do not have all the answers uh, to. Uh, we do not have all the solutions to the problems that we're going to go through today. I mentioned that partly to manage your expectations, uh, but also to throw out a challenge and possibly an opportunity. Uh, we are heading into a time of unparalleled change. You've heard that phrase many times over the last few years. I'm talking about unparalleled change in the context of climate impact. Uh, and, uh, and I do believe uh, that the answers to the questions, the solutions to the problems will be found by the business community. So it's always exciting to come to a, a place like this where I know you are all interested in business. Uh, so let's, um, let's start uh, with a very uh, busy slide, uh, which is just going to sort of frame the narrative a little bit. Uh, so we are now two years into what we call the decisive decade. We call it decisive decade because what happens over the next 10 years will determine what happens over the next thousands of years. We are uh, in an extraordinary pivot point in history. Uh, the world that we envision will be determined over the next 10 years. That world that we envision is a world that is biodiverse, that is decarbonized, that is inclusive, and that is able to operate within the uh, finite constraints of a single planet. Uh, to, um, to meet the, just to put it into context, to meet the Paris Agreement, you've all heard of the Paris Agreement, and the commitment that the world took to, um, to um, uh, to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees. There is significant negative impact at one and a half degrees. Beyond that, it starts to become increasingly catastrophic. So for us to be able to reach these targets, then we have to reduce carbon emissions by 50% this decade, 50% again next decade, and we've got to be at net zero by 2050. Now, to put that into context, in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, the world reduced its emissions by between 5 and 7%. So we have to go beyond what we achieved when we put the world into lockdown to be able to deliver against these targets this decade, to meet the Paris Agreement target. Uh, and the, the, uh, I'm putting here that, um, you know, the, all of this is up for debate and discussion, but I believe the leadership responsibility, the burden that is on leadership now at this pivot point in history is immense. We are the first generation to have the unequivocal facts at our fingertips uh, and the last generation to be able to do anything about it. I always check myself a little bit when I say that because uh, because I, I did study this back in 1985 and the climate science looked a little bit, un, you know, sort of, well, it looked unequivocal then, to be honest. And uh, in 2006, I, I held the, the, the ice cores of the British Antarctic Survey uh, that allow us to go back up to 800,000 years. Uh, and, uh, and we test the, uh, 
the air bubbles in the ice from ice that is up to 800,000 years old to get a sense as to what the atmosphere was like then. So we can, you've probably seen the curves in terms of CO2 versus temperature. It seemed pretty unequivocal then. But for some reason, uh, the world has now decided that it is unequivocal over the last year or two. Don't ask me why the, this wave of realization has crashed over the world now. It was inevitable that it had to. Um, and, uh, and the world is now no longer challenging the integrity of the climate science. So that puts a lot of burden on people in places of leadership. Uh, and organizations will be on the right or the wrong side of the climate crisis. I would suggest that uh, progress is often defined by creative destruction. I think that we are gonna go into a period of accelerated creative destruction. Let us hope that that allows us to accelerate in terms of the progress we need to see with regard to the response that needs to happen um, to deliver this decarbonized world in a short period of time. Uh, and organizations need to drive sustainability into the heart of what they do. We'll speak a little bit more about this in a moment, but, uh, but one of the things that we've really noticed uh, over the last couple of years is that sustainability is no longer on the periphery uh, of uh, the business agenda. It is now deemed to be at the heart of what drives value. So it determines your sales growth. It determines your operational efficiency. It determines how resilient your supply chains are and indeed your brand value. And uh, this is the first time that I'm going to touch on, on this phrase, sustainable performance. Uh, and, uh, and what we see is that there is a shift from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, where business, businesses need to create value for multiple stakeholders. And if they do that, then investors have identified that that gives rise to more durable profitability. And durable profitability allows organizations to be able to perform in a more sustainable way. That is what we believe organizations are driving towards. That's what they want. They want sustainable performance. They don't actually want sustainability. They want to find that zone that exists between commercial performance and sustainability. We call that sustainable performance. And this is not just me talking about in sort of some kind of um, idealistic world uh, that we need to move from shareholder capitalism, stakeholder capitalism. This is, this is BlackRock, one of the biggest financial institutions in the world. This is the basis upon which they are making their investments. Uh, Beth Houghton, um, who may be here tonight, uh, is a partner with the impact investment company Palatine based here in Manchester. Again, they look at the whole issue of stakeholder investment uh, and, uh, uh, and look through that lens in terms of the investments they make. Uh, and, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what are the things we need to consider to be able to get to this uh, place of sustainable performance. The system shifts, the market drivers, the market solutions, geographic materiality, et cetera. Uh, and of course, we need a different kind of we need a different kind of leadership. You know, if ever there was a time for entrepreneurial leadership, it is now. Uh, and, uh, and I would suggest that the, the next unicorns will not be in social media or digital platforms, but they will be in sustainable technology. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned, the world is waking up. Uh, and, uh, and first of all, in terms of enterprise, there, uh, uh, the last count, there was $4 trillion that found its way into sustainable investment by 2025. There is uh, an expectation that $1.5 to $2 trillion per annum will be invested in sustainable technology. Uh, government, we are seeing a plethora of new regulations and policies, whether that is the 
uh, European Green Deal, whether it's the Environment Act in the UK, uh, or whether it's some sort of self-imposed um, policies and regulations such as uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, CDP, that uh, most of the big companies in the world are now holding themselves to account against, or TCFD within the financial community, um, for the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, so we are starting to see convergence between uh, enterprise and government and indeed investors, as I have mentioned in terms of the uh, capital that is being allocated in this direction. Uh, and then, of course, there's the citizen. Uh, you know, 75% of uh, people in the workforce by 2025 will be millennials, and we see that millennials have got different buying habits. Uh, and are making far more values-based decisions. Uh, and, uh, and brands will be on the right side of the crisis or the wrong side of the crisis. Uh, so uh, for many of the clients, and just to put, give some kind of sense as to, uh, to who we are as Anthesis, you know, last year we did 3,500 projects for 2,600 clients. So we get a sense as to the sort of direction of travel uh, and, uh, and what we see is that uh, this agenda item is going from the uh, sustainability and CSR departments into the marketing departments, into the brand departments, because organizations are having to reposition their brands. Uh, and they're having to do it in a way that stands up to scrutiny. Otherwise, if they reposition their brands and then they're found out to be greenwashing, then that's even worse than not doing anything about it. So they've got to make sure that as they reposition the brands, then it is meaningful, it's material, and that it is rooted in science. Uh, and this is a sort of, I suppose, uh, uh, an overly simplistic um, uh, evolution of the market uh, as we have observed uh, over the last few years. Uh, so I would say for, uh, I mean, I've been in this world for about 30 years and, uh, and probably, if I'm honest, 20, and then there were obviously some early adopters, but, but most of the market was characterized by the first one, which was CSR, which is uh, effectively uh, trying to create some good news stories to allow organizations to do what they've always done. I, I remember conversation I had about four years ago with the chief executive of one of the world's largest financial institutions. He was the chief executive for the, the UK-based operations. Uh, and he said, um, for many years, I have chucked more and more money at my CSR department. And I've told them, give me some nice stories and I will wheel you and those stories out as and when I need to. But your role is to allow us to carry on and do what we have always done. Uh, and uh, so I am describing that as a diversion. He then went on to say, but now wherever I turn, I see sustainability. I know that I can no longer do that. And I know that I now have to do something fundamental in the core of our business to be able to make the shift. I asked, well, what have you done? And he said, uh, well, uh, uh, we have... Um, uh, we have evaluated the carbon footprint of using paper cups versus pottery in the tea and coffee uh, that we serve in the office. Uh, and uh, he then went into great detail as to um, what the outcome of that research was. So I would suggest that he has some way to travel on his journey. But that, that takes us into the, uh, the incremental approach, because where we see most companies at this moment in time, is trying to be less bad. They are trying to become more efficient, use less energy, use less waste, use less water. And it is incremental. And you get very fast returns on investment, especially with where the energy prices are at the moment. So it's a no brainer. Uh, what we are suggesting is that we now need to move to a more transformational change. The place that you need to go to if you're going to start to become close to meeting those Paris Agreement targets. And to put that a slightly different way, 
You see, ignore the blue line, that's the CSR diversion. Um, the black line is where most of the world is at the moment. They're doing the easy stuff. They're becoming more efficient. They're becoming less bad. On the y-axis, you see sustainable performance. Now you can put different targets to the top of that. Let's put net zero at the top of that. The only way we can achieve net zero is to do something transformational because incremental will be the law of diminishing returns. And it, it, even if we do virtually everything we need to do, that might get us to 30 to 40% of the way there. We have to transform the way we operate as a world, but in the context of business, businesses need to find a different way of doing business. And of course, we've seen now, and I think um, Jonathan might be talking a little bit more about this, um, something called offsetting. So the way a lot of organizations are getting to net zero now is they're saying, okay, well, let's do what we can and then measure the residual footprint of our activities. Uh, and then we'll look to offset those through investing in technologies, investing in carbon sequestration, such as forestry or nature-based solutions. Now, I can tell you the price of offsets is going up massively. So it's, it's, it's probably doubled over the last year and they are expected to increase rapidly in the coming years. So, so that is then gonna drive people to, to look more closely at how they invest. Do they invest in offsets? Do they invest in technologies to, um, uh, to, um, to deliver transformational change? Uh, and this way, I guess, sort of slightly more complex. But in, for, in order for us to be able to identify how you need to reach this place that we call sustainable performance, you need to understand the systems. I'll talk more about those in a moment. This is what the world needs. We need to capture carbon. We need to um, decarbonize the, um, the energy system. We need to make things differently according to a circular model. We need to regenerate agriculture, and we need to realize the importance of an inclusive economy. These are the five systems that we've identified that are the most important in terms of uh, understanding how those systems are gonna to shift to be able to deliver sustainable performance. And you've got to then look at those in the context of where the drivers are. So this is what the world wants. They want to know how they, the capital should flow. They want transparency. Uh, they want to know how, for example, consumer decisions are gonna change. And they're gonna, they want to know what policy and regulation is coming down the pipe. And then that takes us up to what people are buying at the moment in terms of market solutions. So we're looking at all these different dimensions, these dynamics, uh, when we're identifying how we can deliver not just the incremental change, but the transformation of change. Uh, and where it gets, uh, I think, personally, particularly interesting, is where we start to see the overlap. So if I think about a client of ours um, who, um, uh, who has got uh, net zero ambitions over here, and they've got another ambition over here to recycle the plastic that they use by 100%, one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, and at the moment, they're trying to deliver those two sustainability targets in isolation, in silos. So we got hold of that and we said, well, why don't we have a look at the overlap? Uh, and, um, and see if we can identify a technology, a different way of doing business, some kind of interventionist uh, sort of uh, um, transformational um, uh, change that we can introduce you to with regard to some of the sustainable technologies that we're starting to see come uh, from the incubators and the accelerators around the world. So they're now working with a, a company that, um, that captures CO2 from the stacks of steelworks, uh, captures the CO2, turns it into ethanol, converts the ethanol into bioplastics, uh, and it's delivering against the target to reduce carbon emissions in terms of net zero, and it's obviously delivering in terms of the target to be 100% um, recycled, um, delivering 100% of their product from recycled plastic. 
So I just want to give you a sense as to when we look at these systems, we don't want to look at them in isolation. We want to start to see how they start to overlap and how we can meet these, sustain these, these sustainability goals in a much more holistic and less siloed way. Okay. John. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm the idea of your slide would be critical. Uh, I have to say, ah, but it's not happening. And so well, I actually agree with a lot of uh, what has just been said, but I will give a slightly different perspective. Uh, so, and I found this picture, which is a bit of symbolizing my story. The green wave is the one below there. It's becoming pretty big, but you see the problem. Uh, to get up there. Uh, there is still a lot of established industry, a lot of established interests that are holding it back. Um, so are we really seeing transformational change? That's basically the question I'm ask, asking. And Stuart partly answered it already. No, we're not there yet. Uh, and because basically this coastline needs to change in this picture, uh, that needs to come down. Uh, and that will be very difficult. So I'll give a bit of an overview of where I see options and how it could move, but also show you a little bit where I'm skeptical and might not be moving as fast. Because business is business. We teach it here in the business school. I teach it on this spot, actually. This is where I lecture on Mondays. Uh, so I'm familiar with the spot. Uh, and I want to be hopeful, but I'm also at times a bit skeptical because I've now been studying this not 30 years, but 20 years. But I'm getting old. Uh, and we've seen ups and downs. Uh, sometimes it was great. It was going to happen. You might remember this guy that was nearly the president of the United States called Al Gore. Won the Nobel Prize. Everything was great. And then financial crisis came. and it. Ah, we forgot about it. Now we got the whole new wave and then COVID came. Uh, let's see where we end up. Um, so we want to reach for the sky. We want to reach, it needs to all be green, but then I was reading the newspaper this week and indeed we can reach for the sky in terms of money. And we look at a company like this uh, called BP. You know BP? Yes, we're in the UK, you know BP. And uh, they made a lot of money because you know what? Your high energy prices, they profit from that. It's always beautiful with oil companies when the world is basically facing trouble, they are doing great. Um, what do they do? They, of course, get a lot of that money back to their shareholders because that's what they do. Uh, they, of course, claim, don't tax us, don't tax us. We're going to invest it into low carbon tech. Yeah, but their close rifle, Shell, basically told in the same week, they also made a lot of money. Not yet, we're not yet going to do that because you know what? Things are a bit slow and we have to see and we, basically we're not going to make as much money with low carbon technologies right now as we are with just getting more oil and gas out in the world. And that's the reality. Uh, so if we feel that we're moving in the right direction, maybe, but this is a lot of money and they're not really going there. Another example, just yesterday in the newspaper, uh, the shipping company Maersk actually is the one that recently was one of the few companies that wasn't criticized for its climate target, while many other big multinationals were criticized for the climate target, that they really weren't living up to their promises. But at the same time, this company, because of all the bottlenecks uh, in shipping around the world, they made a lot of money uh, recently as well. And what is the first thing they're going to do? They bought an airline company because uh, the prices are coming down for uh, uh, flying stuff around uh, or at least the shipping is going up so it's getting closer they just want to move stuff around the world that's what they do so it is not yet the case as if the core business of such companies is fundamentally changing uh, we need a lot more effort to be able to do that so we will ever get there it is simply very difficult so this whole idea of sustainable performance is is where it should be going. And we've seen a lot of progress. So indeed, I fully agree with Stuart, it's no longer just CSR and just to kind of have a few nice stories. Really, a lot of companies are really changing. A lot of things are happening. But at the same time, of course, business tends to focus on those solutions that work well. Countries do the same thing. Uh, Boris Johnson will tell you that the UK is great with offshore wind. Uh, will not tell you where we're not so great uh, because that's the nature of the game. You try to show where it's going well. But electricity is only part of the problem. Energy is a lot more. Industrial uh, manufacturing, it's a lot more. Uh, we can't just have a few solar panels on a steel factory and hope for the best. 
Uh, it just doesn't work like that. So there are a lot of hard to decarbonize sectors where it's very difficult to change. They don't really know how to. It might be hydrogen, it might be an electrification through different means and so forth. And really, from an innovation side, you need a lot of technological breakthroughs. And the International Energy Agency looked at, okay, how much have we been improving in terms of our innovation potential in energy over the past decades? It has gone up, it's going really well, but how much do you need now to meet the Paris Agreement target, for example? And that needs some kind of break that you suddenly you go through the roof with new breakthroughs and that everything is suddenly going to work. Well, we had a breakthrough in fusion this week, so maybe, maybe, uh, but sometimes we will hope too much for these silver bullets and that is all going to happen. Well, actually, probably not. So government will have to play a big role uh, because business will be key if, because if companies are not going to change, it's not going to happen. If you just leave it to business, not sure if they are willing to harm their profits as much as might be needed in the short run to then, of course, go and grow into markets uh, that are more sustainable. Is it all pessimistic? No, I think you can look at it in a more positive way and, hey, how can we do this? So I'll show you a little framework uh, that I developed last year. Uh, I had some spare time in lockdown, so I started playing around with uh, PowerPoint. So here you have it, things flying around and so forth. Uh, what is the core idea? The core idea is how do you create a sustainable business model? How do you change this core, the little core in the middle? Of course, you do that partly by looking at your internal business operations, but that's not the only thing. You also need to look at the industry around that and really the market around that. So there are these different layers, and especially for big multinational companies, if they want to be truly sustainable, they can't stop just at their core. They need to also go beyond because they have a huge responsibility for their supply chains. Uh, that is in the news again and again that we don't know enough what is happening in the supply chain. So if we really clean up our act here, if it's still happening somewhere else, what have we gained then? So this is a lot of options what companies can be doing. And I'll start with the positive. What should companies be doing? Probably go for the transformation, the innovation route. How can you do that? Really internally have the low hanging fruit, become more efficient, carbon efficiency, eco efficiency, you name it. And you would think that all companies are doing that, especially now with high energy prices. But it's not necessarily the case. If you, for example, look at research on SMEs, then it turns out that many do not have the means there to really try and target the low hanging fruit. They just really don't know how to do it. So there is a lot of option there to make some quick wins. But you really need to go into the supply chain as well. You need to start optimizing your supply chain. But in the end, you need to create new markets. We need to move away, of course, from the oil and gas market being the energy market. The energy market needs different kind of markets. Maybe we need to go away from making stuff, buying stuff, throwing it away and have more surface economy, experience economy. There are all kinds of labels for that, but it is more about what we do instead of what we buy. Um, but that's the dreaming. How do we get there? What is currently the case is that a lot of companies are not necessarily innovating, but they're more looking at like, oh, hmm, we can't really do anymore what we used to do. We need to restructure. They're basically what I call offload. They are offloading the dirty business. Uh, and that's an important step. So basically, you can first just say, oh, where is the regulator difficult? Where's the government difficult? I ship or I relocate my activities to those parts of the world where it's not much of a problem. Actually, not many companies are necessarily doing that for that reason. Of course, there are things like pollution havens and so forth, but the whole world is changing. So that is more and more difficult, but still some countries are stricter on sustainability than other countries. So companies still have the option to start shifting around. But what you now see is that companies start to really reorganize. They might vertically disintegrate to basically say, okay, the polluting part of our business, it should not be in our ownership. It's somewhere further up the supply chain. Is that helping? Not necessarily, of course, but it could be. The moment you, for example, start divesting activities, it also means that you no longer see that as a priority. You're no longer going to invest your money, for example, like BP in those activities, but it does really depend on who's taking some, who's buying it and for what purpose. Is it for to really kind of slowly let it die or is it to actually make it into another booming business? An example is a few years ago, the electricity companies, E.ON and RWE, 
they did a very complex financial swap where in the end, both were more first fossil fuel based electricity companies. And now one is really focusing on the electricity grid while the other one is focusing on renewables. The dirty business didn't disappear. They just spun it off. And later on, I think was bought by Fortum for, from Finland. Uh, but this does allow these companies in Germany to go into a new direction. And they are both acting on a different kind of direction. One thinks it's more into smart grids. The other one thinks it's more into renewables. But that's a positive way of looking at reorganizing, restructuring, and so forth. But this is not what most companies are doing currently when we talk about climate change, net zero, and so forth. When you hear beautiful stories, we are net zero, we are carbon neutral, and so forth, they're really busy doing this offsetting. And Stuart already mentioned it. Uh, really, a lot of it is in forestry programs or for heavy industry, carbon capture and storage. So you capture the carbon and you put it on the ground. Is this bad? Well, we can have rules with people around the university. Some people hate this practice, others think it's necessary. I'm the pragmatist Dutchman, uh, so I say, yes, it's a bit necessary. For those businesses where in the short term, it's simply not possible to suddenly become zero carbon. You cannot produce chemicals and have no carbon emissions in the next five years. Uh, if you believe that, then it's like dream on. It's just not going to happen. You can believe in green hydrogen, but it's not on the scale that comes close to where we need to be. But we need to invest in it. But currently, you see that companies just say, we need to become carbon neutral. We need that label for marketing purposes. Uh, and I literally had old students asking me, okay, which company should I use to buy my way out of this problem, more or less? And it's like, okay, this is not going to help because what is happening here, you try, as Stuart said, to continue your business as usual, and you just find, try to find ways to allow you, yourself to do that. And that's not the point. The point is that you need to find ways to change. So if you only use offsetting to show the world that you're a good guy or a good girl, not the point here. Um, so what is the story here? The story here is that I see all these options. A lot of the options can play a role in improving sustainable performance, but they're not always used for the right purpose. Uh, it's very often to clean up their own act, but not necessarily thinking of what the consequences are, but it is also being used for those kind of, uh, as an excuse. So sometimes a company like BP will say, well, we continue doing our gas business because we at least do it in the most sustainable way possible. If we would set it off, then some other dodgy company will do it and they won't do as good a job as we do. Those are really nice cases for my students. Think about that. Is that really true? How does that work? Do you know that? Is this just the way to say, sorry, we're not going to change? Or is it really the case that they are probably the best in class in doing it? So in the least polluting way, but it's still polluting. So that is a tricky thing. So I think a lot of the businesses need to ask themselves the questions. Are we indeed doing the cosmetic thing? just trying to treat the symptoms or are we getting to the root cause? Uh, and that discussion is thankfully now changing with initiatives like science-based targets that we really look at, okay, how is this actually going to make the difference to meet the Paris Agreement? Things are moving in that direction. So that is really the good thing. But at the same time, I see a lot of companies uh, that are still trying to look for the loopholes. So basically what I call uh, the, the using the net of net zero to the max. Uh, so you don't really try to reduce anything you do yourself, but you just try to buy your way out of the problem, uh, which is a good old practice in the Catholic church. Uh, uh, but that's not going to make uh, the difference, of course, we know. Um, is it then all bad? No, I believe that you can really think of this offloading and offsetting in a positive way. If you really want to truly innovate, get into new markets and so forth, of course you need to do a reorganization, restructuring of your organizations and so forth. So that can be a means to an end. And then you can start creating new markets and so forth. I'm a little bit more skeptical about the offsetting, but for example, with carbon capture and storage, there is a need for that. Uh, but for businesses where there is really no other option. People are really optimistic now that this is going to happen. On the other hand, we've been there before as well. They were supposed to in, uh, invest in it. And then it's really difficult because the carbon price needs to be very high. There needs to be a lot of basically government intervention before it becomes profitable to do that. Because in the end, you really can't do much productive with capturing gas and putting it under the ground. 
uh, it's a natural gas bubble under the ground then. Uh, yeah, that's it. Well, if you move to renewables, uh, then that has a lot more side benefits. You also reduce all kinds of other pollutions, uh, forms of pollution. So that is probably more productive doing that, but it takes longer and it's more difficult. So in the end, is it all negative? No, I think things are changing. It is a wave and the wave is growing, but as with any wave, <laughs> waves keep and sometimes they're a bit smaller again. So I really hope this time around, we really will see the major change. Uh, there are many signs that this will happen, uh, but don't underestimate the power of big business and big industry. Uh, uh, sometimes maybe we do a little bit too much of wishful thinking as if it's all going to change. And by having a few solar panels out there seeing ah, problem solved, uh, we do it ourselves as well. Um, so sorry for being a little more skeptical, but hey, otherwise we don't have a debate. If we fully agree, then it's no fun either. Thank you. I think we move now to the online part, but I'm looking at technology. It's not the technology guys, it's probably me missing my cue. Hi, Sarah. Hi, did you want me to start moderating um, a discussion now? Yes, please. Great. Um, well, obviously, good evening. As has been mentioned in the introduction, I'm Sarah. I'm the senior reporter from ED, and I'll be facilitating our Q&A um, this evening. Obviously, a massive thank you um, to Stuart and to Jonathan for their fascinating um, presentation. So all of this is all of the jargon words that have been flying around net zero, um, offsetting purpose led business, um, circular economy is sort of my bread and butter and the stuff I do. Um, every day. So great to be joining everyone tonight, even if it does have to um, be virtually. Um, so we've had the chat function on Zoom opened for questions throughout this event, but please continue to use that function um, as the event continues. Um, and I I've been told that for everyone in the room, um, Jonathan will be taking your questions if you wouldn't mind just putting your, your hand up and there will be a roaming mic um, in the room as well. Um, but to give you all some time to think, I'll start with a couple of questions that have come in digitally um, already. We've had a couple of questions coming in about the, as, as Jonathan put it, the net in net zero. Um, we've had one coming in on Zoom from Ajanta who asks, um, Stuart, with your graph on, on um, the trajectories that you used in your presentation, there was a, a dotted line that was an offsetting trajectory. And I know you said that that's a whole other um, event in itself, um, but we're being asked, could you clarify a little bit about what that trajectory would look like and what metrics are being used in that chart? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, for most offsets, uh, we, are, we are looking at the amount of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent that is being captured or sequestered. I mean, a lot of a lot of offsets will also have multiple benefits, so there'll be social benefits uh, as well as um, uh, as well as the carbon reduction benefits. I mean, my my um, it, it's really interesting actually to see how the attitude towards offsets has shifted over the last year, uh, and there was a lot of discussion on it at COP twenty six in Glasgow. Uh, where there is now recognition that the voluntary carbon market is here. So when we talk about offsetting, it's through this voluntary carbon market. Most of the credible uh, offsets are governed by two institutions, one called VERA, one called Gold Standard. Uh, and you've got to go through a torturous process of governance to be able to get your offsets approved before you can sell them into the market. Um, and organizations that want to claim net zero under science-based targets, I'll come back to that in a moment, have got to buy offsets that are properly certified and are of the right quality. So there's an increasing amount of governance that's coming into the whole offsetting piece. There's also talk now about the UN starting to take over the leadership of the, the governance piece around the voluntary carbon market. Um, What's interesting is that uh, most of the businesses that we work for now are embracing something called this science-based science targets, science-based targets initiative. 
which is basically a, um, a route map as to um, how you get from where you are now to this place that we call net zero. Uh, and and it, is, it is quite demanding and it focuses primarily on the avoidance of emissions and the reduction of emissions. And then it forces you into a place of identifying what transformations or technology interventions are necessary within that journey. Uh, and then, then after that, then, then, um, then uh, it says, and it's quite strict about how much can come into this category, but there's a residual amount uh, that can then be offset. Uh, however, they are now um, open to the concept that while you're going through that journey, effectively driving your carbon emissions down, you can use offsets as you go through that journey to be able to reduce your impact as you go. So, uh, so science-based targets, which is probably the, the most important measure of how companies are tracking against their net zero targets and now much more embracing of offsets. In fact, I think I'm right in saying that the only two NGOs now that are not supportive of offsets are Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace. So it's, it's a mechanism. Uh, and we often use this sort of picture of a bathtub. So, you know, all the, all the CO2 that has been emitted um, that is um, uh, related to man-made uh, man emissions uh, over the last 100 years, it's still in the atmosphere. So we've got a certain, we've, if you imagine a sort of bathtub is able to accommodate a certain amount of water, so the planet is able to accommodate a certain amount of CO2. Uh, and it's not as if the CO2 that we've emitted just sort of disappears or dissolves somewhere. It's still, it's still in the atmosphere. So we've, we've only got a certain amount left. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so I think offset, my, personally, I think offsetting has got a role to play where it allows us to just release a little bit of the water. Imagine releasing some of the water out to then give us a little bit more sort of headroom uh, on, this, on this journey that we're on. And so if we can allocate capital through offsets to be able to plant new forests and protect existing forests, forests to protect mangrove uh, swamps uh, and to create environments that captures carbon from the atmosphere, uh, then that buys us time, which is what we need to be able to deliver the transition that has to take place through to 2050. So it is, if it's done properly, it is a useful, uh, economic instrument to help drive the change that we need to see happening. No, I fully agree. And that was partly my, my point with the green parts of the circle that it has a function. Uh, I'm just not sure if every company is using it in, in that way. Uh, and if they're all going through the route of having the difficult ones uh, to get it properly certified, but you have a lot more insight into that and uh, which type of companies are really going for that or some are just trying to go with whatever they find because they want to quickly show that they become so-called carbon neutral. Thank you. And we had a similar question that was, is net zero realistic for airlines? So taking into account everything that we've said there, I think, yes, but probably over-reliant on the net um, at the moment would be the answer to that. Um, we've had plenty of other questions coming in, so I'd like to move from carbon to stuff, really, resources and materials, if possible. We've had a question come in on Zoom um, from Manoj, who I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, um, about overconsumption. Um, so companies have to go for the idea of marketing with the idea of increasing consumption, the question said. So how can businesses begin to negate and control that um, when ultimately it is destroying the systems upon which these businesses depend so in time there'll be risks like material scarcity um, and risk across the supply chain to do with poor climate resilience but at the moment in a linear economy so the opposite to a circular economy it's seen as necessary um, and in preparing for this talk I wrote down a question of my own which is how can we as businesses make the business case add up for a sum of Stuart's priority system so one of those is remake having these new new business models and then Jonathan touched that as well so, so perhaps shifting to an economy in which we are defined by what we do and and not what what we buy 
So if I could put that question to, to both of you about stuff and why we're consuming too much of it and what businesses can do to help that while retaining profitability. I'm willing to give a start. It's really difficult because there are academic debates about degrowth, for example, and this is this whole idea of, okay, we, we, we need to buy less stuff, but we also know how bad we are uh, at it. Uh, I have, for example, way too many pairs of running shoes because I think that there are different types of mud that need different types of shoes. Uh, is it really true? Probably not, because I run with a fella who only has one pair of shoes because he's a student uh, and he seems to be okay. Uh, he's actually beating me every time. Uh, so maybe I don't need it all. Um, it's, we're part of the marketing machine, uh, but we also do it ourselves. Uh, this is going to be a very hard sell. Uh, even the academics have difficulty seeing what degrowth is, uh, what there are uh, debates about sufficiency, what is enough, uh, and that you really focus on that. Uh, because all the models of how we measure, for example, how the economy is going are financial measures. Uh, so if we would do degrowth, uh, we would call it a recession. Uh, and a recession is a bad thing. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's really going to be a major change then uh, in, in how we consume and what we consume in what way. And this is where it then needs to move away. I do think that a lot of companies see a lot of options there. And that is around this business model innovation thinking uh, that you'll probably be paying now a lot more for all kinds of services, apps online. Uh, you used to buy things like, for example, Microsoft Office. Now you probably have Microsoft 365 and they tell you that it's a good deal. No, you're just paying them now all the time. Uh, so the good deal is on their side. So the more companies are figuring those kind of things out, it can actually still lead to the same kind of value generated, but just in a different way. Um, but it, 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 is, it is a very, very complex change in society uh, because uh, be honest, we like stuff. Uh, it's not that simple not to like. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think the first thing, thing is we just got to say that this, this is not easy uh, because to be able to affect the kind of behavior change uh, that we would need to see over the next 10 years uh, uh, would be extremely challenging. So that I think drives us to more circular models. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, you know we, we have very well known uh, examples such as you know, interface flaws, and I'm looking at the carpet tiles here, and I'm wondering whether they come from interface, uh, because you know interface moved to a leasing model, and they say actually you don't want to own your carpet, you know you just want a floor covering, so just lease it, right? And when it's let, looking a bit tatty, which is not, still looks very good. <laughs> um, when, it looks a bit, when it looks a bit tatty, then we'll just we'll just uh, we'll just pick it up, we'll recycle it, um, and then we'll. We'll bring, bring back and replace it. The same with Philips with light. And they say, actually, you don't want to own light bulbs. You just want light. You know, so we'll move to a leasing model. Uh, and, um, you know, some of the clothing retailers are saying, uh, actually, you don't want to own your own clothes. You just want a wardrobe. Uh, and you want to click on. You want, if you want to wear something different, rather than participate in fast fashion, just, just lease something for a weekend and then give it back. So, so there, there, there are new... Um, there are a lot of new business models and you know even in i noticed that some as the stores have now got a um um some um some parts of their stores that are dedicated to second hand well for most of my life you would not advertise things as second hand you know but but now you know it's um uh it's it's fashionable to wear to buy and wear second hand uh because people want to be able to demonstrate that they are part of the solution rather than part of the problem uh, and so there is a, an accelerating transition um, towards these circular business models. And, and it's probably an oversimplification. But for most of my life, what I've seen is that the world has operated in a, um, a double finite model, as I call it, uh, which, which basically means that we are making stuff um, out of, um, within a finite model out of finite materials. Uh, and then we are fueling them or feeding them um, out of materials that are also finite. And we need to move to a model where we are 
making stuff in an infinite way, which is effectively fully 100% circular. Mm -hmm. And we are feeding them and fueling them with um, from infinite sources. So wh what does that mean? <laughs> that means that, let's look at the automotive sector. So I now drive an electric car uh, and that is powered from renewable energy. So sun and wind is from an infinite source, right? But I know the manufacturer of that car uh, has used a lot of energy. Okay, so I'm that, so that is still in a linear model, which is take stuff out of the ground, make something out of it, sell it, throw it away model. Okay, not in a circular model. Okay, so that is still so so now I'm in a, a finite infinite model, right? We now need to move to um, manufacturing cars that are 100% circular, and then you're in the double infinite. I don't know if that, that makes any sense, but they're the kind of model. Now, if you move into that kind of world, then you can continue to enjoy stuff if that's what you want to do, because actually the impact on the planet is minimal. Big philosophical debate, I accept. <clears throat> Yep. Thank, thank you. And I, I had a question following up on that come in on Zoom from Lee, um, who says, this is all well and good, but what about organisations that have really built their business models on aggressive consumption? Um, so like fast fashion businesses, um, be encouraged to adopt that, that mindset. And I know that for fast fashion specifically, this is something that MPs looked at um, a few years back, essentially saying, well, we're probably not going to get there without policy. Um, interventions as has been done with plastic packaging um, tax so I don't know if you guys have any views on whether we need to go further than just this is an emerging wave um, for, for this kind of business I made the point already partly towards the end of the presentation and uh, I think policy is needed uh, I, I personally do not trust companies to go all the way uh, without any kind of incentives uh, in what way, if that's partly based on voluntary programs first, maybe, although if we look at the experience there, I've studied, for example, uh, the problem of obesity and how uh, food and drink companies are reducing sugar or not. Uh, it was all going to be voluntary, voluntary. And actually, when the sugar tax was coming in, they started doing something. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to just trust business on doing the right thing without proper incentives. But a lot of companies do not deny the need for proper incentives. They actually want to have government intervening because it can help them. If these incentives are clear and they know what to do and they feel that they're better at going for that than others, then actually they can see that as a source of uh, their competitive advantage. So it's not necessarily <laughs> bad. Uh, but indeed, I do agree that, that somehow the government plays a role. This complete idea of it's a free market and the market will go by itself because we customers are changing. I just don't buy into that because Deep down, most of you probably will be like myself, a bit hypocrite at times. It's called moral self-licensing. You buy something that really is then recyclable and circular and so forth. So ah, I've done my deed for this week. Uh, so now we can go drive in my diesel car again. So here you have it. Uh, it's even a Volkswagen Blue Motion. You remember that one? Uh, I have a cheap diesel. I'm so proud of it. Um, so uh, I should get compensation from Volkswagen still, I think. Great. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry, Stuart, what do you have to add on that point about, yeah, aggressive consumption and the role of policy in circular economies? Yeah, uh, and, and we're seeing that policy and the regulation coming through, especially within the European Union and the, and the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, we're seeing that, that we're, we're definitely going to see uh, policy and regulatory drivers. But I would also suggest that um, companies are losing their social and financial license to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and it's also a function of us not pricing in the externalities. And you can come up with a new economic model without regulation uh, because, because at the moment, the cost of uh, fast fashion in terms of the planetary impact and the cost associated with that is picked up by society. It's not picked up by business. So, I mean, to, just to slightly aside from... <laughs> fast fashion, if I, if I may, but I mean, if you just look at bees in the sort of agro food sector, uh, so agro, agro food sector that is dependent upon bees is worth about 250 billion to about $600 billion a year. Okay, dependent upon 
pollinators, small flies and bees, mainly bees, right? So what do we do through our agricultural practices? We kill bees because we place no value on them. They're not on the balance sheet. So, so we need to look at a way of bringing some kind of economic instance, could be through policy, uh, where we start to price in these exter externalities. Otherwise, society rather than business picks up the cost. Well, Stuart, I'm sure that placing a value on nature um, and other externalities is a separate talk in and of itself. It's definitely something I've spent many hours on. Um, so I'll probably move on. And I'm aware that I can't see the room. There um, is some I'm question sure. in the room. So maybe we go through one question in the room. Yes, I was going to say, I'm sure that there are people time now, So I in... slightly feel guilty now. I know. I'm sure there are people in the room with their hands up. So if I could ask you, Jonathan, to, to ch choose someone or maybe a couple. Uh, I know exactly who because she has the microphone already. <laughs> and it's really big and yellow, so it's often. Hello, thank you. My name's Julie. I've got a comment and a question that's policy related, so it's nice and timely. My first one, which is a comment, is... Emissions from processes like from cement and steel and fertilizers can't avoid CO2 emissions by the nature of their fuel stock. So I, I'd just like to say CCSU is needed. So I, I, you know, you, you've said that before and I'd like to come back on that. Anyway, my question kind of relates a bit to the policy in the fast fashion. We are hypocrites when we make purchasing decisions and it's usually cost which drives our purchasing decision. So sustainable businesses need to be profitable, otherwise they're not sustainable. So UK industry in particular complains a lot to the government about increasing costs, energy costs or compliance costs, carbon tax costs, energy prices, and they, they complain about an imbalance with their competitors in Eastern Europe or in the US or in China, et cetera and they become less competitive because those countries generally are higher carbon economies, but they can produce things cheaper and we buy them. So that results in carbon leakage. We have companies here that are closing down to relocate to those higher carbon economies. So what's the solution? And is it a global agreement with binding reduction targets to create a level playing field for all the businesses around the world so that they can invest without the fear of losing them, them becoming a sustainable business? And I, I ask that because in case anyone didn't know, Paris did not go that far. It just simply wanted reporting. So what's the answer? Well, I think one of the answers is a cross-border carbon tax. Uh, but the word tax is not very popular in life. Uh, but it becomes inevitable if they can't really find true agreement on a global level that all countries are moving the same direction, then those countries that want to be leading uh, will have to figure out measures uh, to level the playing field in different ways. But of course, that runs into conflict with the WTO and it's all uh, rather complex. You can't just do that. Uh, like, oh, we, we, we'll stop uh, Chinese products coming in. Uh, but yes, this will be part of the equation that you really start looking at trade rules, uh, what will be taxed, yes or no, what kinds of other barriers are possible there, yes or no. I mean, well, this country has uh, raised its barriers again, so uh, it should not be shy of doing that. Um, when I now get presents from the parents, then I have to pay first before I can open the box. Uh, so uh, yeah, things are changing. That will be a political discussion unless they can figure it out with the next COP and the next COP and the next COP, but I don't think they will uh, because the interests of uh, big uh, emerging economies is simply different. Uh, so I don't see that happening. Uh, I mean, you've got, you, you mentioned in your, um, your opening around um, cement and steel, which are the, the big problem sectors. Uh, and uh, and you know the the only way we can really deal with that, as you say, is is carbon capture. And then and then you went to you know the um, uh, the big problem we got with the structure in terms of how do you level the playing field uh, when you've got so many national interests uh, de uh, dependent upon um, democratic systems uh, that are relatively short term. Uh, you know. Uh, 
you know, I've heard it described by a lot of those um, uh, emerging economies, uh, and they're saying it's it's like a, arriving at a restaurant, uh, and um, and all the other parties have had the starter and main course, and I just rock up for the dessert, and then they try to split the entire bill uh, with us, and you know that's what's going on, and uh, and we need to find a way of identifying how those um, countries that have become wealthy uh, based upon the emission of um, greenhouse gases over many decades uh, pay more than the emerging economies, which is a, is a very difficult playing field to level. Yep. Yeah. A couple of questions about ESG reporting. Um, first one, do you think governments should make ESG reporting mandatory for all companies, not just quoted companies? But also within ESG, do you think that the E is too important to bundle in with the S and the G and should have its own entity for reporting? I'm looking at you there for this one. Uh, so, uh, I think in 2025, the UK government have said that uh, that all businesses have got to report, a report on their carbon emissions. Uh, so they're slightly different to ESG. I mean, we use we tend to see ESG more uh, uh, as the sort of phrase that's used by financial institutions. Uh, so there's lots of ESG filtering of investments. So in fact, I think um, last year. Uh, one dollar in every three went through some kind of ESG filter, uh, and it's and it's like a credit rating. Uh, and so, for me, the the issue with ESG is that the scores, the SG scores that are coming out, are coming out of black boxes, and it's really difficult to get into the data that's driving those scores. So I can understand why if you are an investment manager and you're working for an organization that says, well, you can only invest in certain assets that have got a particular ESG score, then it's quite helpful just to put the company name and it spits out a score and, you know, uh, but, but in terms of driving what we need to see in terms of incremental and transformational change towards, for example, net zero, uh, I think that um, the ESG will have its limitations in terms of us requ requiring all businesses to report to ESG. I just, I'm not sure what that gives us, uh, apart from alerting organizations to the importance of embracing sustainability, let's call it that rather than ESG, uh, to be able to unlock the capital that they need to be able to, um, to um, to survive or grow their businesses. I, mean, I I'm not too negative about ESG because it's a term that at least helped mainstreaming the whole uh, movement. Uh, uh, the socially responsible investment thing is now a bit to the background that re didn't really take off. This one did take off. Of course, then it needs to be filled in a, uh, in a certain way. But I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't criticize it so much because I'm glad that actually finally they found a way to get the financial institutions to have a look at it. Uh, while before uh, ESG as a term, which I think, I don't know how long it has been used now, but about 10 years that you now hear it a lot more. Uh, so that's the good thing. It's a little bit similar with net zero. I don't really like the term net zero. We talk about it now as if we've done this for ages, which is not true. <laughs> it's really recent, uh, but it does help get a lot of people like, oh, we need to do this. For whatever reason, because I find it a bit funny at times. Uh, I remember uh, having discussions about carbon neutrality, which is very similar somehow, and that didn't really work somehow. Um, so, of course, the way you fill it in then is up to debate and very much depending on how governments want to fill it in and how they want to regulate it with reporting requirements and so forth. But at least finally, they might get to some kind of agreement of reporting requirements that are not just about financial accounting but also by more social forms of accounting. So there I'm, here I'm the glass half full person, I have to say. I think we can go back online. Bye.
Of course. And yeah, you only need to Google the word ESG to get all manner of controversies going on on around that. Um, Just this week, Bloomberg has an analysis out about ESG funds and about how several of them um, have actually increased investments in fossil fuel majors who, as you've said, say that they need less tax to invest in green, but can't really prove that. Um, Someone in the chat just now is saying that somehow Boohoo, the fast fashion giant, managed to get some ESG funding as as well. So again, another topic that probably warrants its own separate hour. Um, Online, I've been grouping together some of the questions that are coming in, and we have some that are about SDGs, because I feel like we've talked a lot about what corporates um, are doing here. So we have a question, um, a couple of questions in from Pavan, um, who asks, how can SMEs get supported um, to, um, to move beyond incrementalism? Um, especially if they're in developing markets. Um, And Poan also asks, should SMEs um, be offsetting? Is it a different picture than if a corporate is using that? I think the story for SMEs is very different because they are not the same way resourced. And very often they play a role as being somewhere in the supply chain of a bigger organization. Uh, So... uh, Yes, they should be expected to do their part, but not in the same way. They don't have the same sense of responsibility or the same kind of means. Uh, But as I said in my talk, I do believe that a lot of SMEs have actually a lot of opportunity to pick some low-hanging fruit where they are just not seeing it for a lack of knowledge or a lack of means uh, to do that. And this is where, again, government programs can come in uh, to support people and so forth. We had a fantastic presentation last year about a program which was all to help SMEs to become more digital uh, because with digital, the same thing, you would say, oh, there are lots of opportunities, but still many SMEs are not picking those up. And actually while they were doing that, uh, there were quick wins. And then they figured out that we can actually also reduce carbon emissions while going digital with a lot of things. So there were a lot of side benefits by just having SMEs be part of a government supported program uh, to move in that direction. Uh, so this is very much where a government is not kind of saying a ban and fine and the whole thing. You no, know, it's support, help, uh, let people that do not have the full knowledge see what is out there, what they can do. Um, so I think it's really about support when it comes to SMEs, but also from the bigger companies where they are part of their supply chain. Uh, this is, again, the responsibility of these key companies uh, that are driving their supply chains and their supply chain management should also help those they work with, the little companies, to change how they're doing their business. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I think that it's going to become more and more pressure on SMEs as uh, as the organisations at the the top of the food chain start to uh, look more at their scope three obligations, uh, which effectively scope three means that you've got to drive your um, your net zero ambitions through your supply chain. So the the um, the carbon performance of your supply chain has got to be managed within the overall net zero aspirations that you have as an organisation. So you have to move your entire supply chain towards net zero. You can't just move your company. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, with with most big businesses, they've got a lot of SMEs in, within their supply chain. So. Uh, so I'm uh, just trying to think of an example. Uh, we do a lot of work with Tesco. So uh, one of the um, projects we've done with Tesco is to work with their treasury department, uh, where they, um, uh, they've come up with a way of uh, empowering their supply chain to measure their sustainability performance. Uh, and... Uh, and if they're able to demonstrate a certain improvement in performance, they get better financial terms uh, as a supplier to Tesco. So these are some of the sort of economic instruments that we're seeing. Uh, and policy is very important as well. But these are, I, mean, I tend to be a believer that actually the only institution now that is powerful and agile enough to be able to accelerate the transition at the speed that we need to see it is business. Um, so I particularly like these kind of um, these kind of initiatives that I see with the likes of Tesco, who are trying to um, to encourage uh, and financially incentivize uh, SMEs to be able to move in the right direction. Thank you both. And we've had a question about 
on the other hand, um, SMEs that are already leaders in one or more um, areas of sustainable practice. Um, it's from Richard who asks, how can SMEs that are already doing good um, raise their voices and be recognized as leaders? Um, at the moment, he says he's seen a lot of bigger companies might have more communication power, but might not be performing as well, or they might simply have more power to exaggerate um, and greenwash. So advice for SMEs that are leading on this to get the support that, that they need and the recognition and networking that they deserve. If I can answer that, I think you have to split SMEs. We talk about it as if it's one homogeneous group, and it is not. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's just a matter of size. And a lot of those are actually innovative startups that try to be the game changers here. Uh, and those really are driving and trying to change. But there are also a lot of uh, uh, the little shops that don't really know how to change. Uh, and that's what we've been talking about so far uh, a lot. Um, we did study this a few years ago in the Netherlands uh, to see, okay, uh, smaller companies, the startups that try to get into the uh, uh, energy market, how can they also get more influence politically? Uh, and it was difficult indeed. They, they, it was based on interviews and they complained to us. It's like, okay, we're not being heard the same way as the big companies are being heard. Uh, back in the day, we still had this company called Royal Dutch Shell. We lost it now. It's no longer Royal Dutch. It's just Shell and it's British. Uh, <laughs> but they, of course, played a big role in the energy lobby in the Netherlands. Uh, they were closely connected to the government. What some of the smaller companies that were actually doing really well figured out, uh, the only way for us to have influence is that we partner with some of the bigger companies that want to look forward. So they actually started doing their lobbying uh, together with some of the bigger ones. And then they also felt the frustration because while doing that, their message was being watered down because that was the consequence. That was the price they were paying for doing that. Still, they did manage to get things to change, uh, regulation being way more favorable for renewables and how to get it into the grid and all kinds of technicalities that need to be arranged there. So it wasn't all a bad story. It did work. Um, but some are really actually good at, uh, at, at getting their voice heard. Um, so uh, I just uh, finished the study and it's based on, uh, again, energy companies, smaller ones in the Netherlands. Uh, sorry, this is because I'm from there and we studied it uh, because we speak the language. Um, and one of those uh, I'm quite proud of because it was set up by a former student of mine. Uh, and this became a company that really understood the political and communication game. So for example, there was a big electricity company that wanted to get rid of one of its coal-fired power plants. And then they said, we want to buy it, one euro. Uh, and they put it all in the newspaper. So everyone heard about it. Uh, of course, the company didn't want to sell their power plant for one euro, uh, but it was all to bring the message. Well, you try to get rid of something that is of no value. Uh, so you've been going the wrong way with your established business. And they really got a lot of free marketing out of such kind of just being very smart in what is happening and, and grabbing that opportunity. Uh, so they've become the poster child of how can we change things? Of course, ironically, what happened later on, they were bought by one of the bigger ones uh, because this is how it goes. Uh, and I guess then the founder said, ooh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, it's still there. Uh, it's still a platform for green energy because it now has become part of the portfolio of a bigger company doing all kinds of different ways of trying to get into the market for renewable energy. But there are definitely ways to get hurt, uh, but it is, it, it is difficult uh, because of the political route. A lot of around sustainability and especially energy is so much regulation driven. So do you have the contacts in government? Can you, do you have the right kind of lobby channels? Uh, and this is where, really where they are struggling. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is an amazing time to be a challenger brand. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, th I think, I think about if, um, you know, in, in 2007, if, uh, if you had said to somebody in 10 years time, there will be an electric vehicle, 100% electric vehicle mass produced with a range of over 200 miles uh, that is valued, has got a market cap that is greater than General Motors and Ford combined. Oh, and by the way, 
that company doesn't exist yet. It's not set up yet. You would have said, no way, no way. I mean, it, it is an extraordinary time, I think, for businesses that embrace this agenda um, to, um, to raise their voices. Uh, and, uh, and actually, you know, we, we, we work for a lot of big organizations and they say to us, hey, look, you know, um, we've been working in this model for the last 40, 50 years. You know, it's carbon intensive and it's linear. You know, how do we move from this to zero carbon? And how do we close the loop? You know, how do we, how do we move from this, this, this take, make, throw away model to a model that allows us to recycle 100%, right? And it's so difficult. It is so difficult. You know, that, that's why we were working for a tech company recently and they said, you know, there's, um, uh, uh, there is $250 million of our product on eBay at any one time. You know, how do we get it back? Uh, and, uh, and the reality is you've got all these small businesses that are starting up who are much better at getting it back than the OEM tech company that we're working for because they're small, they're agile, they're, uh, and, uh, and it's really difficult when organizations have been working traditional linear models to because all their inventory, all their ERPs, all their bonus, all their incentives, everything is set up for a linear model. Uh, so I suppose it's not directly responding to the question, but I just want to, uh, I just want want to really make the point that I think this is an incredible time for small companies, challenger brands, to really drive into this space that we're talking about. Thank you. I've I've noted down from there the key challenge, the key takeaway. Sorry, is to be a challenger and to think about how you can work smarter rather than harder and and get that free free airtime. Um, I'm aware that I've only got about five minutes um, left until you need to wrap up the discussion. So I don't know if there are any more questions in the room, Jonathan, that you'd like to take. There are a uh, front row question and in the middle. It's like... Hmm? Sorry. No. Don't apologize for asking a question. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you've touched on a lot of really interesting different topics and you briefly mentioned stakeholders. So I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the average consumer. So we talk about cost, we talk about tax, but the problem is that almost inevitably companies just up their prices and it basically it's, it's elitist. It's expensive to be sustainable. It's expensive to go and buy the recycled Patagonia jacket. So I would like to hear your thoughts on whether this is correct and ethical from the companies and how we can convince them to absorb more of that cost rather than pass them on to consumers. Thank you. So uh, this takes me a little bit back to the sort of standard performance and looking at the, the overlaps. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a, um, a project we did um, quite recently uh, for one of the world's largest organizations that built a factory in a part of the world that is water scarce. Okay, they wanted to be uh, water neutral in their process. Uh, and, um, and to get to about 80% uh, water recycling is quite straightforward. Uh, to get to 100% is incredibly expensive. Uh, but they decided that's what they want to do. So they spent the money on that. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the community within which they had positioned this factory uh, was running out of water. Uh, so you got this incredibly high-tech factory that had, um, uh, had many tens of millions of dollars spent on it, uh, and the community effectively died because they didn't look after the stakeholders that was their employees and the community within which they were positioned. Uh, and uh, so it was, just, it, was, it was just really interesting to watch um, because actually what, what they thought, that within the typical business economic model, they thought that they were investing capital in a fixed asset, but effectively what they created was a stranded asset because they didn't think 
beyond the boundaries of their business to other stakeholders. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and this is one of the reasons why, of course, there's so much interest in ESG when it comes to investors. Because investors now are seriously worried with, with, with all the changes that's going on in the world, with, um, the, you know, the severe climatic events, with water scarcity, with all the kind of things that we hear on the SDGs. You know, they're, they're, um, they're concerned that there's going to be more and more of these kind of stranded assets. So, uh, so what I would, uh, would encourage is for businesses to start to think in a different way where they need to think about stakeholder capitalism, where they look at how they deliver value for all stakeholders, not just for the shareholders within the typical sort of mindset of traditional shareholder capitalism. And to pick up the second part of your question with the, the consumers, why is it more expensive? It's a little bit like the market for new innovations. It's just costlier to make those. So it's easier to put it in the market and position it as a more expensive product because you can recoup the costs you had from doing that. Uh, so usually it's, it's just a matter of time, uh, but because of that, indeed you get this green elitist uh, movement. Uh, it's, it's almost inevitable. Tesla even made it its business model. They wanted to first create a very expensive car that had the wow, which allowed them to make more money and to then slowly get more to the masses. And they're still trying to lower the price of the next model and so forth. Uh, so. I think it's almost a general curve. <laughs> it, it's almost inevitable uh, because the whole system is set up for the current products that are not sustainable. So it is needing that system change. The moment you want to be the challenge, you want to do things in a different way. It would be great if you can do it in a cheaper way, but that's the holy grail. More often, it will be a little bit more expensive and you need to figure out ways to get that money uh, back. And this is why it is a little bit more expensive, but that market uh, of people that want to pay them more is growing. And this is then hopefully helping the mainstreaming uh, so that it becomes accessible for others. Uh, but that's the whole thing, the scaling up uh, question. There was, uh, I think a final question. I don't know the time. Yes, probably close. There's a question in the room and then I give it back to you, Sarah. Um, hello, my name's Sean. I'm an environmental scientist, but currently studying an MBA. So I have more of a kind of logistical question. Um, so in my previous work, I would kind of work in a consultancy and we would uh, forecast carbon emissions, we'd forecast the water quality. But the data that we had wasn't that available and it wasn't particularly detailed, which will inevitably have a big impact on the accuracy of the forecast that we were making. So I was intrigued as to whether you think this is going to have a big impact on business as a whole to meet these targets and meet the Paris Agreement, because there's obviously scientists that could do it a lot better than we could. But a lot of businesses are quite dependent on consultants to forecast these things for them. So I think it's a bit of a, a challenge and an issue. And I kind of wondered what your opinion was on it. Uh, so. When, um, uh, when I set up Anthesis uh, eight years ago, in, in many respects, it was, um, uh, it was born out of a place of frustration uh, because what I could see was that there was lots of talk about sustainability, but not enough action. And where there was action, the failure rate was incredibly high. And at that time, it was more anecdotal. Uh, since then, uh, I've seen Bain has done some research so that in 2015, they uh, identified that, um, that there was a 2% success rate with sustainability programs and a 20% failure rate. And in between, it was diluted in terms of value. And they did it again in 2018. Uh, and, uh, and the success rate had gone from 2% to 4%, and the failure rate had gone from 20% to 47%. Okay? So, problem. Uh, and um, so uh, I became sort of fairly sort of uh, in, not just frustrated, but also curious as to why this was. And what, um, what I identified was that, um, that organizations were um, either on their own or with consultants were looking at sustainability in a very siloed way. So carbon, in isolation of water, in isolation of waste, in isolation of circular economy, and so on. 
And the reality is that they're all interdependent. Uh, I also identified that, uh, that they were looking uh, at sustainability in a geographically siloed way. Uh, and the reality is, is that most companies have uh, global value chains and you can only be successful with your sustainability program if you look at, uh, at the program across the value chain. And the third area was that the data that was providing the evidence base to underpin the decisions that people had to make was incredibly weak. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so when we set up our thesis, we said, "Hey, blank sheet of paper." You know, this is uh, the, the. I mean, it's an incredible opportunity from a planetary and societal perspective, but it's also an incredible business opportunity. So these are the market failures. So let's try to create a new company that deals with all that. So yeah, that's a longer story, but uh, but I do believe that the uh, the data now is much more robust than it was. There is more regulation coming in um, to govern the robustness of that data and to make sure that um, the, 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 the wheels are, are kicked in, in, in a similar way to your financial numbers uh, and, uh, and how you have to subject your financial numbers to an audit, for example. We're some way off that, but we're going in that direction. Now, I fully agree the data issue. We were just in a meeting around sustainability for the university. I think some people in the room here were on that online meeting and we discussed this exactly. So what should we do? Oh, how are we doing currently? Oh, we don't really know. Uh, so people tend to then hesitate to do something if we don't know what the current state of action is. Uh, what is our carbon footprint? Do we know it exactly? What is the breakdown? Uh, so it is very important that we do do that. I do believe sometimes that people also use it for the wrong reasons, like, oh, we can't yet measure it, so we can't do anything yet. Uh, and uh, that it's being used as an excuse. But things are moving in the right direction. Uh, but it is a big challenge because we've been talking a lot about carbon here. And with carbon, we can kind of measure it. Uh, I've also been moving more in the direction of biodiversity. Best of luck measuring biodiversity. Uh, it's on so many levels. And in what way uh, do you look at ecosystems, the genes? Uh, it, it's mind boggling. It was interdisciplinary work with people that actually really understand biodiversity. I don't. And after that, I thought, okay, now I understand why business is struggling because it is really, 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 really difficult. Uh, you can't just capture it in a nice one metric like CO2 equivalent. No, it's all over the place. So it will be a big struggle, but I think it's it's necessary to improve it because if you want to value it. We need to somehow at least quantify it. If we monetize it as something else, but at least to to give some feeling of okay, this is this is where we are and where we need to be. Uh, so yeah, crucial a crucial uh, challenge. Sarah, I'm uh, handing it over to you. I guess for final words uh, because you're really nicely high up on the on the on the wall here, which you don't know, of course. Of course, and I can't see where I am in the room. It's a very strange experience, but I'm delighted to have been able to, to chair. And on that last point about data, if I had a pound for every time someone came onto one of our events, because we host our own events quite often, um, and said, oh, you can't manage what you can't measure, um, then I would probably be able to have a circular economy startup myself. <laughs> um, by now, it gets raised all the time. And the question is always about what technologies to use, what metrics to use um, comes up. Um, I'm glad that we were able to cover so many topics um, over the past hour or so, all of them important, some of them to warrant their own lecture. So definitely to the hosts, there, there, uh, there could definitely be um, something to be said about is ESG credible? What is ESG investing and how do we measure and monetize nature um, potentially? Um, but I'm aware that I'm running slightly over time, about nine minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to Fiona in the room for closing remarks and next steps. And thank you so much for inviting me to chair and to Stuart and Jonathan for great presentations and answers to the, the questions. So thanks everybody. Uh, thank you particularly to Stuart and Jonathan and to Sarah. Thank you very much for joining us and facilitating the discussion uh, online. Um, really wide ranging discussion. Um, my head is going round in circles at least um, yeah, um, with lots of things to think about. Certainly enjoyed uh, the discussion around the large corporates and what SMEs are doing, the relationships between the supply chains and whether large corporations 
consultant could kind of eat this sort of where they help their supply chain participate in some of the changes that they might be able to do more easily than themselves. So really interesting. So thank you to everybody here and also online for some really interesting questions and as I say, lots of uh, interesting answers and things to think about. So many of you will know that we have a fantastic series of lectures coming up. And really in the same theme, we have our annual Grigor McLennan lecture that's named after the first director of the business school. And that's going to be given by Franz Berghaus, who is the professor of environment, society and climate at King's College London. And the event is going to be taking place on the 3rd of March. Uh, and he will be joined by a panel made up of Kathy Hobbs, a former MBA student of ours, who's now head of ESG at North Edge, and Professor Frank Gills, Professor of Systems Innovation and Sustainability here at a AMBS. So both um, online uh, and face-to-face, -face, but hope very much that um, everybody will be joining us. But can I take this opportunity? The room has seemed very quiet because normally we have lots of rounds of applause. So we've got to have a really good round of applause <laughs> here now for our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff. <laughs>